Please be seated. The Lord be with you. And also with you. This is a reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Now tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls all his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that there is the same, in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who have no need of repentance. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one of them. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls all her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And this is the Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I worked down in Tribeca on the day of September 11th, 2001. I never got down to work that day because by the time I hit the tolls on the Henry Hudson Parkway to get into Manhattan, the lady was taking the tolls and said, don't even try to get downtown. She said, a, tr a plane has gone into the World Trade Center and you'll never get there. At that point, I thought it was a dentist, you know, flying a Beechcraft Baron who got terribly lost and said as much, and the woman said, no, no, this is terrorism. She said, we're just getting word that a second plane flew into the other tower. I remember the days after 9-11. When we first went back, I worked at the Borough of Manhattan Community College, which, which Derek represents, among other campuses of the City University. When we first got back, I couldn't believe the rubble. There was so much destruction. It was everywhere. I remember thinking they'll never be able to clean this up. But what struck me most was the signs. There were signs and more signs and more signs and all of them went like this. Have you seen my father? And there was a picture of a smiling man. If you see him or have any word about him, please contact me at the below email address. Or have you seen my wife? And there was a picture of this beautiful, smiling woman. Because nobody takes pictures of people when they're miserable, right? They're happy pictures. If you see her or hear of her, please contact us. And it gave contact information. There were signs after signs all over southern Manhattan. People looking for the lost. And you know, today, 21 years later, there are more than 1,000 people who apparently perished at 9-11, of whom we have seen no trace whatsoever. They were just vaporized, I guess. But every family who did not get the closure of knowing that, that, that here is, here's what happened to your loved one, 
every one of them lives every moment with just a flicker of hope. Maybe the unlikely will happen. Maybe, maybe my loved one will show up. There was another lost young man. His name was Alan Robinson. Alan Robinson was a member of what Tom Wolfe, the author, called the me generation. Sort of the late, at last, the end, tail end of the baby boomers. And Alan was a classic example of the me generation. Alan thought the world owed him a living. He thought he was very special. But he didn't think he owed anything to anyone else. He was very focused on himself, quite selfish. But he was also seeking something, I guess. There was something lacking in him because one day he put as many of his belongings as he could into a knapsack, took all the money he could find, and he left his home and went off to find himself. He was gone week after week after week with no word back to his family who loved him. But Alan didn't find himself. He just got more lost. He got lost in drugs, he got lost in alcohol, he got lost in addictions. He got so lost that what little jobs he could find, he lost because nobody was catering to the me generation. When he had enough, he would would stay in a shelter, or when he was sober enough, he would stay in a shelter. But many nights he had to sleep outdoors because he was homeless, He was broke. He was lost. And then one day he was in a shelter in Vancouver. And in a moment of lucidity, he was laying there on his cot, listening to the noises, the moaning, the groaning, the the, 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 the ravings of people around him who had odd, strange thoughts that were coming to voice. He smelled the smells of dirty people, smelly people. There were smells of urine, smells of feces. Even in a Salvation Army shelter, it was dirty enough that he was very unhappy. And he said to himself, I can't do this anymore. And for that moment, suicide for Alan Robinson became a real possibility because he thought his only way out was to leave life completely. In the gospel today, we've been following Jesus on the road to Jerusalem week after week. And on the road, Jesus has been teaching about the kingdom of God and about discipleship. He says the kingdom of God is a place where the values of the world are inverted. The kingdom of God is a place where there is a place for people like Alan Robinson. The kingdom of God is a place where where the poor are loved and welcomed where the marginalized are embraced and brought in. Jesus says, if you're having a party, invite the poor, invite the blind, invite the lame, invite the cripples. Invite all the people who can't give you anything back. Because that's what your Father is like in heaven. What Jesus is doing in all of this teaching is he's revealing the heart and the mind and the character of God. And God is the one who loves the lost, who loves the poor, who loves the broken, who loves sinners, and aren't we all foremost among them? Like Paul says in his reading, the Lord came to save sinners, and I am foremost among them. Who of us couldn't say that to? 
And so now Jesus is, is, is gathering people around him. The people who come to him are an interesting group of people. Luke says, tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around him. Tax collectors and sinners. Let's look at that group. Tax collectors were despised. In, in this culture, the, the, in, in, in the, the Jewish culture of the time, tax collectors were quislings. They were traitors. They were people working for the occupying empire. They were stealing as much as they could and sending as little as they could back to Rome. And that was an okay deal because the emperor got plenty. So the tax collectors were abusing their neighbors. They were thieves. They were crooks. They had no moral fiber, at least so they were perceived. But they're all flocking to Jesus. Why? Why them? And Luke says sinners were coming. Well, how would anybody know they were sinners? I mean, I'm a sinner, you're a sinner, but I mean, we try to keep our sins pretty private, right? But these people are public sinners. Everybody knows their shame. They're prostitutes. They're, they're, they're weasels. They're greedy. They're arrogant. They've committed all the classic sins, but they've done it so publicly, just like the tax collectors. And so this is not a group of social uh, uh, celebrities. This is a group of people that nice people shouldn't be with, right? Because that's exactly what the Pharisees and the teachers of the law think. Because as the tax collectors and sinners were gathered around Jesus, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law watched. Now, why do you think all those sinners and tax collectors came to Jesus? They came to Jesus because in a society that rejected them and scorned them and marginalized them, he brought a word of hope. He said to these people, God loves you. He said, you are made in the image of the Father. That you're cherished by the God who makes his reign to reign on the good and the evil as well. And so they came to listen to Jesus to see if he could tell them anything more about themselves that would give them hope and that would make them feel that there was a pathway for them to salvation. But then we've got the righteous crowd. They're there too. And they are, this translation says muttering. The, the, the Greek word is, is also sort of uh, onomatopoetic. It, it's a, it's a gar, garganzo, I think it is. And it, it has an interesting uh, meaning. It means they're whispering. They're whispering. They're saying, this man, he welcomes tax collectors and sinners. What do you think of that? Huh? Shameful, right? So he's murmuring. They're murmuring. And they're whispering. But they're also triangulating. They're not going to Jesus and saying, hey, uh, what's with the crowd here? They're saying to other people, they're trying to turn people away from Jesus by speaking behind his back. How often is that tactic used today? That, that, that hideous, poisonous practice of triangulation. But Jesus knows what they're doing, and so he gives them these parables. It's always good to, 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 to know that Jesus is speaking to some group when Jesus speaks. He's not here speaking to the crowds, nor is he speaking to the tax collectors and sinners. He is speaking to the ones who are murmuring. And every parable is a challenge that asks us to change. There is something in these parables that are completely un, uh, un, unimaginable. There's something strange. There's, there's a, one author calls it the crack of the uncommon that runs through every parable that's fully developed. Listen for it here. Suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? 
What type of idiot would do that? Clearly, Jesus had not gone to the Harvard Business School. Because the Harvard Business School would tell you, cut your losses. You've lost 1% of your assets. It's the cost of doing business. The sheep wandered off. It's a stupid sheep. Take care of the 99. And Jesus says, the kingdom of God is different. The kingdom of God is, is, is the place where every lost sheep matters. Every lost sheep is beloved. Every lost sheep is special in the eyes and the heart of God. It's reminiscent of Ezekiel 24. God is talking about the bad shepherds of Israel. And he says, I myself will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up their injury and strengthen the weak. I will shepherd the flock with justice. Jesus is telling the scribes and the Pharisees, listen to what God is like. God cares for every last sheep. So when you murmur and say that, Jesus, wel I welcome sinners and eat with them, you are getting everything wrong. And it, when he says welcome sinners, the Greek word means not, hey, sinner, how are you? It means embrace the sinner. It means bring them into, into the heart of your life. And, and in, in this culture, you didn't eat with people you didn't care about. This was before McDonald's sold its first hamburgers. So people didn't eat casually with others. They ate with the people they loved and cared about. That's meal fellowship. That's what they're, that's what they're accusing Jesus of. And Jesus is saying, wait a well, hold on here. The lost sheep matter. And God is out there seeking the lost to save them from death. Because that's what Jesus saves us from. And to bring us home. Because that's where we will live. The challenge of this gospel, and the second, the second uh, little parable is like it. The woman who's looking for her lost coin. Keep in mind the sheep does nothing, nor does the coin to get found. The only thing the sheep has done in this parable is get lost. The only thing the coin does in this parable is sit there being lost. It is the one who sweeps. It is the one who searches. It is the one who looks. It's the shepherd who does all the hard work. And when the shepherd finds the sheep, there is rejoicing in heaven. Now, Jesus isn't kidding here. Heaven rejoices over one repentant sinner. More so, Jesus says, than over 99 who have no need of repentance. But is there anyone in that group? Is there anyone who doesn't need repentance? Really, there are two groups of people here. There are the, the lost who know they're lost and the lost who don't know they're lost. <laughs> and Jesus is saying, you're better off to be lost and know it than to be lost and not know it. Because if you're lost and you don't know it, you're not open to the shepherd when he comes. And of course, the, the, the last parable in this, in this chapter, one that we didn't read, is the, chap, the, par, the parable of the lost son, the prodigal son, which ends with the words to, spoken to the second son, come and celebrate with me. Rejoice with me that the lost is found. Because this brother of yours was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and was found. He's found. Our challenge in this gospel is A, to recognize that we are sinners and we need the shepherd always to seek us, to find us, and to restore us. But secondly, the challenge here is to know that we are also assistant shepherds, or, if you will, sheepdogs. 
We are invited by the Lord to participate in the search. He sends us on his behalf to round up the lost. But to do that, we have to go where they are and not be ashamed of it. We have to go to where the homeless are and befriend them, as Anna does all the time. We have to be open and willing to speak of our faith to people we meet in our daily life who may desperately need to know that there is someone who cares about them enough to pray for them or to share a blessing. Because the lost need to know that someone is looking for them. When we last left Alan Robinson, he was lying in a cot in Vancouver at the Salvation Army shelter smelling smells that he didn't like to smell, hearing noises that he didn't like to hear, and thinking of ending it all. And as he laid there thinking these thoughts, a guy came through the shelter and said, is there an Alan Robinson here? Alan Robinson? He said, well, that's my name, but nobody knows I'm here. The guy said, there's a phone call for Alan Robinson. He said, well, it couldn't be for me. The guy said, there's no other Alan Robinson. Answer the phone, why don't you? So he did. He got on the phone, and before he could say a word other than hello, a familiar voice said to him, Alan, it's time to come home. It was his mother. It was his mother. Mom, how did you know I was here? What she had done is she had been relentlessly searching. She didn't know he was there. She was relentlessly searching for him in every shelter or in every place where Alan might have been. And it was the providence and the love of God that she found him at just the moment he needed to be found. We are like Alan in some ways and like his mother and others. We are called by this gospel to be emissaries of good news. Let those who have ears, let them hear. Amen.